Welcome to the Unified Brand Podcast, brought to you by Elements Brand Management, a weekly brand building and brand strategy podcast to help you unlock your brand's potential, stand out from the competition, and create impact. So today we're joined by Uli Applebaum, an award-winning marketing and brand strategy consultant with more than 20 years of experience, founder of brand strategy firm First the Trousers, Then the Shoes, and author of the Brand Positioning Workbook. Great to have you on the Unified Brand Podcast, Uli. It'd be good to learn a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on your podcast, Chris. Very excited about that. Uh, so yeah, your introduction is almost perfect. Maybe to add to that is I've been in the account planning and brand strategy business for the last 20 years, the first part of my career in Europe, all over Europe, whether it's uh, Germany, uh, Hungary, works a lot in Central Eastern Europe. And for the last 20 years or so, uh, moved to the US and worked a couple of the large agencies here in the country from Fallon Worldwide at the time to BBDO to Leo Burnett. And then six, seven years ago, we decided for lifestyle reasons to move back to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I live today. And I started to grow a family and it's a great place to raise a family. So the job market is a little tighter here than in the big city. So I decided to start my company, first the trousers, then the shoes. And just as the name says it already, it's a strategy first company. So I don't do any execution or anything like that, which gives me a lot of liberties because I don't have any agenda besides developing the proper strategy for my clients. But as the name suggests already, I could have called myself, I don't know, Applebaum Brand Consulting or something boring like that. But Calling it first the trousers, then the shoes is for me also a way to illustrate that I consider the strategic development process as a creative problem-solving process. So there is an element of creativity associated with strategic development, which I wanted to capture. Plus, it's hilarious for me to listen to my clients introduce me to their colleagues as, and this is only from first the flip-flops, then the shorts, or first the trousers, then the shoes. So I always get a kick out of that. Cool. Yeah, it's great to talk to somebody because we're the same. Like strategy first is the most important thing. And actually, if you get that right, that influences the external anyway and the expression of the brand and the way that it's marketed. So I think it's a crucial part of that. And if you don't do that, you end up with something that's kind of a vanity piece rather than actually something that's going to create any sort of impact. So that's cool. So how did you get started in brand strategy and positioning? It's a great question. Actually, I went to a European business school um, with a time called, uh, was called European School of Management, where you have like 120 people who qualified for the school that spent a year in France, a year in Oxford, and a year in Berlin together. And 99% of my co-students went into into management consulting or finances. And uh, myself and a friend of mine decided to go into advertising instead. And to be honest, um, I stumbled across positioning by Trotton Rees when I was a student. And then I stumbled across Ogilvy on advertising. And I was always super interested by you know, how do you shape people's perception? How do you influence the way they think so that they act upon this way you try to, you know, get them to think about your your offering and your brand? And so I started to do uh, internships, both in advertising and in on the corporate side. And I remember at the time I talked to a, a CMO at Kellogg's in Germany, you know, things were going pretty well until he told me, you know, you got to understand if you join Kellogg's, you're going to think cereal, you're going to breed cereal, you're going to, all you're going to do is talk about cereals day and night. And I was like, okay, for my ADHD and low attention span, that's not a solution. So I discovered account planning in advertising. And that was really what uh, got me excited because that's all about trying to understand people, how they behave, motivates them, and how you can help shape their behaviors and their attitude. So did a couple of internships there, fell in love with it and uh, haven't looked back since. So that's that's really how I stumbled into this. Uh, I could now be in Hong Kong in a big financial position. Instead, I'm in Minneapolis doing brand consulting. That's where life takes you sometimes. Definitely. But which one would be more uh, fun? Obviously, the, the Oh, the I'm exactly where I want to be. So uh, I couldn't yep. complain. So uh, the little turns in life took me exactly where I wanted to be. So I couldn't be happier. If you were to sum up brand positioning, how would you describe that to listeners? So that's a great fundamental question, right? So my definition is maybe a little bit unique in the sense that I really look at it. It's not my unique definition. I'm not the owner of this definition, but it's really looking at a brand positioning as the sum of the associations you want to create with your offering amongst your core target segment. The core is really brand associations. This is what, as a marketer, I believe you need to try to build. Why? Because this is how brands are formed, right? Brands are bundles of associations. 
I give you a piece of information, new piece of information. You connect that with something you know already. So you build networks of associations in your brain based on what you hear from people, what you experience yourself with the brand or the offering, what you read about it, what they advertise. And that creates networks that are stored in the brain and that needs to be refreshed or activated. So because that's how the brain works, I believe the best way to describe a positioning statement is really defining the desired associations you want to create with your offering. That's the extremely simple, but it's not simplistic, very difficult to achieve. But that's the way I would describe it. Yeah, that's interesting. So what are the most common mistakes you see marketers sort of doing when it comes to brand positioning? If it's creating those associations, what are some of the mistakes that sort of generally happen? We can talk about hours about this, but first of all, it's not look at the brand positioning in terms of associations but in terms of like a checklist of things to say about the product. You know, when you have six benefits, 26 reasons to believe that you then want to convey in a Facebook ad. When you think about it in terms of brand association, you come very quickly to the conclusion that you can, if you're lucky, build one or two or maximum three association. And that assumes you have a lot of money to do so, right? So it really radically forces you to focus on what is really the essence of of what is really the piece of information or emotion or content I want to associate with my brand. So the reductionism is number one. Number two, which I see a lot is we're getting a bit lazy. So a brand positioning becomes sort of like a compromise amongst everyone involved defining the, you know, so it's great tasting, it's convenience, it's healthy, it's ecological, it's all these kind of things. By watering it down or by only focusing on sort of like the generic benefits within a specific category, you know, butter tastes good and, you know, great. So what about the 26 other brands of butter that claim the same? So I see a, for whatever reason, desire not to push an idea into the positioning statement. And what you do basically is you delegate the responsibility to come up with an idea to the creative team, right? And that is unfair. That leads to a lot of waste of time because then you see first creative ideas and then you wonder, is really the butter taste great, but we want to communicate about the butter? You know, so you start to ask strategic questions when you see creative executions. And that is frustrating, costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time. So really this lack of desire to want to really concentrate and make a decision about an idea at the positioning level. So you still need to allow for the creative process to elevate this idea into something really creative and different, but there needs to be an idea in your positioning platform. If there is no idea that said, but it is great, cars have four wheels and drive fast. You know what I mean? There is nothing here that would tell the consumer, oh, gee, your car has uh, four wheels. Awesome. I want to look into it, you know? So That's not a big sort of like miss I see when developing strategies. And the third one, if you want me to continue, you see that in the last few years, right, is this obsession with specific branding philosophies. So like a few years ago, it was cultural branding. And now what you see is, um, you know, everyone obsessing about a brand purpose. So you're basically prescribing your solution that the solution is going to be to talk about your purpose. To be honest, if I buy a toothbrush, I don't really care about your purpose. You know what I mean? If I buy buy toilet paper, I don't really care about your purpose. And what you see, especially amongst young strategists, young marketers, but also more senior ones, is this, you know, what is the solution to the problem of my brand has? It's a brand purpose. For me, it's like going to a doctor and say, Chris, I don't know what you have. I'm not going to diagnose you, but aspirin is your solution. You know, and you're like, but I came with a shoulder ache. Or a week later, you come with, I don't know, you have a nail in your toe and the doctor would say, well, you know, Chris, now aspirin is your solution. You're going to get an aspirin. You're going to feel much better about that. So it's sort of like this obsession with one of many, many solutions on how to position a brand, which in this case is a brand purpose. Yeah, that's really interesting. So on that basis, what are some of the misconceptions that you see so around brand positioning? So there's sort of the things that people hold about brand positioning that potentially are sort of falsehoods or even sometimes just way off? It's like two extremes. But on one hand is we don't need a brand positioning. And I've client literally of large car manufacturer that have told me, you know, we don't have time with strategy. We'll go straight into execution, which is mind blowing because it's like, okay, what exactly do you want to 
associate with your offering through your communication? How are you going to judge whether your communication is delivering? So that's like one area, which is pushing away the, basically the put your trousers on first, you know, so it's like putting your shoes on first and then trying to squeeze your trousers over your shoes. But the other side is this over obsessing with the brand position, right? So spending six months noodling every single word in your brand positioning, you know, is it a funny brand or is it a quirky brand, you know, and discuss this for six weeks. So, which for me is a waste of time. But again, if you come back to a definition of brand positioning being sort of like the sum of associations, then you can have this conversation. Is that really an association I want to claim for my brand? If yes, let's talk about it. If not, let's not overthink it and waste our time with it. So it's really the two extreme, basically, that you see really like too superficial or overthinking it and over discussing it to death. If that makes sense. Definitely. I've experienced both of those and uh, it's tricky to navigate. Around <laughs> it really those. Is. Yeah. So from that, when you talked about reduction earlier on, there was something I was thinking about. So with reduction, when you do that, what's the first step to you finding that core piece of sort of the center of what your positioning is going to be based on? Is that something that's already there in the company in some cases, or is it sort of defining that and then drawing upon that to then build upon? So that's an interesting thing. And here I see a difference between because I work both for B2B clients and I work for B2C clients and I work for small companies like entrepreneurs or startups and global multi-billion dollar companies. And what I've noticed is when you talk to B2B companies, especially when you talk to the sales force and um, the value those guys have is they spend a lot of time talking to their customers, right? So they have all this corporate knowledge, but it's often usually hypotheses, right? Is you talk to three clients and they all say, you tell you the three things, consistent things. I've talked to other clients and they tell me something slightly different. So your hypothesis is not actionable per se. So what I've le learned in in the B2B world, it's often about capturing this corporate know-how and understanding of your consumers. And then through, you know, research or targeted customer discussions, try to quantify it and narrow it down, prioritize it, right? Because that's when you really identify sort of like what is the single most important thing. So with B2B companies, I've learned it's the knowledge is often there. They just don't know it. And it's about surfacing it. For B2C companies, um, there are different ways to look at it. For me, one of the most effective way, and I've become a big believer of that in the last five to 10 years, it's about reframing a problem, right? It's reframing a category. So you have a brand of yogurt. Is it a brand of yogurt or is it a way to satisfy an emotional need compared to other products outside the yogurt category to satisfy that same need? I've learned the, the biggest aha moments and the key to unleash sort of like growth is often to look at ways to reframe the category. And that can be around consumer needs, around consumption occasions, around all these kind of things. So, you know, a few years ago, I did work in the lottery category. And the lottery category is basically just either numbers when you have like these, you know, big jackpot lottery products. So all you can do is basically change the numbers. That's basically a very boring format. But then in the US, you also have what's called the scratch games. You buy a little card, scratch it. If you have three apples, you win. If you don't, you don't win. And there the um, variables you have at your disposal are really the picture you put on the front of these scratch games, the name maybe of the scratch game, but at the, at the end of the day, it stays a square with the scratch numbers. And with the research we did for a couple of lotteries in the US made us realize that the scratch games is for consumers to manage their moments. Um, so it's a moment management tool. So what they do is they buy a ticket, keep it in their pocket, and then they are bored waiting at the dentist for it to be their turn. That's when they would pull it out. Whereas sort of like these draw games, so a different category, but draw games, that's the big jackpot thing. This is a mood management tool. And what that means is, you know, I woke up this morning, shit, I got, sorry, bad language. I got, uh, you know, three three new bills that came in and I need to pay. I don't know exactly how I'm going to pay that. I'm feeling down. You know, I'm going to buy a lottery ticket that's going to make me feel better. Maybe I'm going to win. So they manage their moods. Or, you know what, I've seen three number six in the last three hours. There was a cab that had a number six. I needed to go through the sixth floor. 
that makes me think, oh, today is my lucky day. I'm going to buy a lottery ticket that has a six in it. So reframing the category, as I said, draw games in the lottery business around mood management and reframing the scratch game category around moment management leads you to a whole new world of opportunities in terms of the type of products you can launch to manage the mood or to manage the moment and creates a whole new perspective on how to grow the category. So that's what I mean. So in the B2C category world, it's often about reframing the way consumers look at a a specific offering and designing your marketing plan or your marketing activities to support this, right? You cannot fool the consumers, obviously, so it still needs to be grounded in a consumer reality, whether it's a need or a, you know, a, an emotion or an occasion or something like that. That gives you the aha moment where you're like, oh, we haven't thought about it this way. Yes, that gives me so many ideas on what we could do, as opposed to focusing on, so is the yogurt now with strawberries or you know, with the bioculture or whatever other product attribute you might have, unless you have a product attribute that is really mind-blowingly revolutionary and new and different for a category. But the reality is in in the especially packaged good world, in 90% of the cases, everyone works with the same attributes, right? So you taste great or you taste better or you taste greater. So you got to find a different way to talk about it. Yeah. So I always think of it as um, when you're talking then I was taking a walk down the the package though, you know, when you're in that supermarket Mm -hmm. and I always think of it as uh, that relevancy something that's relevant, you know, that you can understand it, you can sort of almost intrinsically get why it exists, I think, Mm -hmm. from a point of view of how it's positioned. And I think that to me is always when it jumps out, when things jump out, when you can have that relevancy. And when you were talking about the yogurt side of things, it was, yeah, it's really interesting that you have those variables that you can use, but they're finite in certain situations. So do Mm -hmm. do you find in those that there is a need sometimes to create those subcategories or like you said flipping the idea that reframing that category itself to kind of create more relevancy but in a different way and just on the back of that the creativity that comes from what you said there where you flipped it to the with the lottery category and how you changed it the explosion of creativity from that must have been been amazing especially for people in the industry who'd worked in it for a amount of time and didn't see it from that that perspective yeah and that that was absolutely the case so um when we presented the results, this was a fairly big project. My uh, So first, the outcome of the sort of like analysis, and there was a mix between internal workshop, qualitative consumer research, quantification, because then we'll also be able to quantify the size of the opportunities. And my initial reaction, frankly, was that, okay, my client is going to push back very hard when we reframe the way they look at the market this way. And you know, three quarter into the presentation, the CEO of this organization I was working with looks at me and says, so what kind of product ideas do you have to fill that gap? And I was like, whoa, 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 take it easy. That wasn't the assignment. The assignment was to find growth opportunities by looking at the category in a fresh perspective. But then we followed up with another project. And indeed, we came up with over 70 new product ideas based on this reframing. And I literally had people in the meeting that had been in this lottery category for over 30 years that came to me after the meeting saying, you know, I never thought about the category this way, but that makes so much sense when you put it that. And that's the power of an insight, right? It's like this, oh my God, it's so obvious. How come no one has thought about this? So yes, you absolutely have that. But the reality, Chris, is you also have people who resist any form of change, right? So they sell yogurt, they want to sell yogurts. You cannot get them to change their mind, their point of view, because that's just how they're wired, if that makes, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. So in terms of subcategories in themselves, is that something that you look to do in certain markets especially, or is it something that you just decide upon depending on the particular product or company you're working with? The methodology I used is based on this, and sorry for the shameless self-promotion, is based on these brand associations, right? And the way I've done an analysis of over 1,200 case studies of effective brand building, like FEs and stuff like that, and came across or what I defined as 26 sources of brand association. The way I typically work with my client when it's a pure positioning assignment is I explore the 26 associations with them. And many of these associations have things to do like substitute categories, um, need states that are being satisfied, uses occasions. And those are all things or weakness in the product of the competitors. And those are all exercises that are part of the broader process 
that basically invite you to look at subcategories. You know, so if you, let's say, focus on what are our competitors doing, what are their key strengths, but what is the one weakness that we don't have or can have something to, to offer to overcompensate this weakness, then you start to create a subcategory, whether you start from the outset with the idea to create a subcategory or whether it comes out of the strategic process itself. But yes, yeah, so it's very much wired into that. But then again, as I said, some clients are very open to that. Some are like, no, 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 that's, I don't want to reframe, I don't know, cereals as a snacking occasion that opens the world of snacks as my competitive set. You know what I mean? They'd rather stick to you know, morning breakfast occasion. That's what we want to focus on. So I don't know if that answers your question. So yes, you identify them if the client has appetite for them as part of the process. And that is usually where the excitement happens, right? Yeah, definitely. I was working with someone recently and the industry itself had, there seemed to be a trend going on with regards to how everyone was jumping on the same thing in terms of, mm -hmm. and it all had AI in it. It was AI and you know, mm -hmm. I can't talk about the specific industry, but it was AI and then that particular thing. And it seemed that everyone was jumping on board that and the client wanted to get away from that in terms of not being so tech heavy, more mm -hmm. focused on user experience side of it. Because the AI thing is kind of a bucket that if you put stuff in, it's quite hard to quantify what that actually means a lot of the time. Yeah. What does that mean for the individual? But people are jumping on the back of it because it sounds cool to a mm -hmm. point. And do you find that with certain things where people are trying to align to something just because they think it is trendy or, or sounds like it should be a good thing? That is my biggest pet peeve in the whole marketing and advertising industry. That's what I meant earlier with the brand purpose, right? So yep. it's like, yeah, that's the cool trendy thing. Everyone is going to do that. But I look at it as an opportunity because that it's an invitation to do the exact opposite, right? Yep. And if five brands in the category speak about a sort of like half ass a brand purpose, and I'd come with factual, factual, functional product benefit that really deliver against the specific problem the consumer has, I'm winning. You know what I mean? And if I want to feel good about the world, I can adopt a puppy or something like that, but <laughs> I don't need to do this in my job, you know? And the other point you're making with AI, which I find interesting, and again, I see that a lot in, especially in the world of technology, is a lot of these product features are driven by the company's internal need, right? So. In the world of IT, you see you see that translated into a full automation. That means if I get you as an IT company to sign up to my website, to become a customer, to set up your features the way you need it, with me not having to do with that, there is a tremendous value for me as a company, right? And I think AI as well is for me a bit like this promise of something is going to do something that is going to help you somehow, you know what I mean, without being specific about it. But then you notice this is driven by almost internal consideration because in the IT world, you see a lot of people are annoyed by this sort of like automation and trying to reach someone to answer a question when you have a problem turns into a massive nightmare because they then send you to the Q&A, which has 20 questions, which hopefully one of them will answer your problem. And if that doesn't work, you can maybe talk to a little uh, you know, automated assistant that's going to ask you 20 questions. So it's getting very frustrating. And especially when you are an IT customer with large budgets, you want to have the white glove service, right? So you, I want to be able to call Chris, you know, I don't know, Microsoft or Oracle, say, Chris, I have a problem here. It doesn't work for me. Uh, what can I do to fix it? And what I want in that case is for Chris to say, you know what, Uli, I got you. We're going to put an engineer on the problem and we're going to solve it. So that is more expensive for the company, obviously. Um, so a lot of IT firms try to tier their customer segment based on, you know, minimum sort of like human resources required to service that company to white glove service. But the point being, a lot of these features and offerings are driven by the company's desire to be efficient and save money rather than to provide a better solution to their customers. You know what I mean? When you yeah. look at it this way, then you can ask, well, I'm a competitor. How can I offer a better solution to a customer um, versus all these automated solutions out there. So here you start again to look at what's the weak spot in the category that I can claim for myself. And maybe you become the white glove technology firm and carve out this uh, unique space in the whole field. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, the case itself as well was it, it was space that you wouldn't really want too much 
automation, AI, it was kind of almost felt like it was encroaching upon the human side of it, which is, it was an interesting why people were going after that in the space. But yeah, anyway, it was kind of interesting to see that and see why they'd all jumped on this same bandwagon yeah. with this trend. Um, so can you tell us a bit more how sort of businesses improve their brand through effective positioning? So many reasons, right? So first of all, which I've noticed is a brand positioning. First of all, you cannot develop a brand positioning with like two or three people within an organization, uh, you know, determine what it is and then force it down everyone's throat, you know, it's to be a collaborative cross-functional process because everyone needs to buy into what the end positioning is going to be, you know. Salesforce, product development, marketing, finance dude needs to know what are the two, three associations we're going to focus on building in the next year or two years and stuff like that. So the first big benefit is alignment, internal organization. So there is no wasted synergies. There is no people with different agenda working on different, you know, pushing different objectives. Everyone works towards the same task. The second benefit I see is simply more efficient resources allocation because if we know what the two or three brand associations are we want to create we know what the advertising campaign needs to deliver again consistently and continuously we know what the packaging needs to look like we know what the promotion needs to look like we know what new product innovation needs to look like we know what sponsorship so there is just a more efficient allocation of your budget and also you create sort of like this a cumulative effect, right? Because every initiative you spend money against in the organization builds the same associations. And so you basically invest in your brand and in your brand property in a much smarter way, as opposed to, you know, spending 1 million doing this. And then, ooh, we were approached by a potential partner to run some kind of like PR activities on something completely differently. And then the advertising agency wants to change the creative idea every six months. So, I mean, there is a tremendous amount of waste going on there, which a positioning, if it's well-defined, will allow you to avoid. And the last one is simply, if a positioning statement is developed properly, it's going to appeal to the consumer. It's going to make the consumer think it's going to help your brand to stand out. And it sounds silly, right? But it's going to make the consumer look at your brand and say, ooh, that's interesting. Or I haven't thought about it this way. Or that's really a value that I'm getting from buying your brand that my competitors don't provide. So. That's the opposite from my car has four wheels and drives fast or my butter tastes good. You know, if you if you get as a message, well, this butter tastes great, there's no reason for you to buy me or, you know, unless I'm the only brand in the grocery aisle because everyone is sold out, then you'll say, oh, yeah, I regularly remember him, I'm going to try it. So it really allows you to increase the persuasiveness, if you will, or the motivational appeal of your brand message and your communication. So interestingly on that is, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the book? So the brand positioning work, why did you write it? How did it come about? And what do you hope to achieve with it? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea came literally across 20 years, it took me 20 years to write it. So, so much for speed on my side. And what I noticed really is I was working at the time on different Procter & Gamble brands in many different European countries. And what I noticed is sort of like patterns in, in brands that were successful, right? So I noticed like, you know, one brand in one market, in one category was, let's say, using the country of origin hook to make itself look more appealing. But then I was seeing another brand in a different category was using the same country of origin hook or another brand would look at, you know, have a special ingredient and romance that to differentiate its brand. And that would be like in the cosmetic industry, for example. But then you'd have in another country, a food brand that would take the ingredients and romance that to differentiate its product as well. So I started to see, okay, that is patterns. What is going on here? And then over the many years, I started to collect. I've always been obsessed with like case studies and collecting case studies and all that stuff. And I basically asked myself the question, how many of these patterns do you can you identify? And that's how I came up with these 26. And these patterns is what I call these sources of brand associations. And there might be 26 and a half or 27, some of them overlap and that's perfectly fine. But once I noticed that, oh my God, there are these 26 patterns. What if when you think about potential either messaging strategy or positioning platform for your brand, instead of starting with a clean sheet of paper, you examine these 26 sources of brand association and ideate around how could a country of origin help my brand? You know, how could a brand archetype help my brand? How could 
understanding the, the usage occasion helped me position my brand. And what I've learned is you come up with way faster, way more and way better solutions when you use these 26 sources of association to think about solution about your own offering than if you start with a clean sheet of paper or with a preconceived notion of it needs to be a brand purpose or it needs to be cultural branding or it needs to be a product-based benefit. So you are way more flexible in your thinking. You overcome your biases. So that's the methodology. And I've started to use it like literally 10 years ago, first sort of like when organizing workshops and then COVID hit. And I started to use it when I started my consulting firm here in, uh, six years ago, because it's a methodology that is really effective and moves and is fast. And then when COVID hit, I always had this idea to write a book about it, you know, to have it on my bucket list. And I decided, okay, my business crashed when, when the fear of COVID spread all over the world. And I decided to write the book during that phase and make the most, make most out of it. What I think what it does, it does several things. It helps younger marketeers and strategists gain literally 20, 30, 40 years of strategic positioning developer know-how in 100 pages. You know, we don't train our young strategists and young advertising people anymore. It's all training on the job. They don't have the benefit of the kind of training I received when I was a junior. So here's an easy way to access that knowledge to younger people. For marketers who are most ambitious and want to be more creative, what it allows you to do, it allows you to overcome all your biases you have. You and I have been in the business for a while. There are things I know always work. So the default option, and you see that a lot with very senior marketing folks on corporate side, they've had, you know, four or five successful brand launches in their career. And they have always been about uh, identifying a functional product benefit. So their mindset is to say, whatever category I work in, I need this functional product benefit. But it's a bias, right? Which really limits your the pool of potential solutions you can tap into. Whereas what this tool does allow you to do, it allows you to look at your brand from all these different perception perspectives, also overcome your biases and come up with solutions that you may not have thought of or thought would be possible. But that assumes, obviously, if you read the book, and you are entrenched into, oh no, it's all about brand purpose, everything else is crap, then there will be no value in this book. If your mindset is, maybe there's other, there are other ways to look at my problem than the typical way I usually do, do it, or my organization usually does it, then it becomes a great tool because it allows you to look at your assignment from all these different perspectives. Yeah, it's a great resource. And, and there's some in there that are so awesome. That, and in that kind of thing as well, when you have that open mind, it's so much more fun in terms of creativity. So if you can take that on board and you can be more creative, and I know what you mean about those kind of biases that you fall back on and you fall into and you kind of, you see some things that work and therefore you think you have to have that. But actually having, it's not then fair on the brand you're working with to consistently fall back on biases because yeah. every brand's individual, every brand's unique. So therefore, you need to have that unique approach. And I think, yeah, it's quite an exciting thing. I always get excited when I find something that is informative and new and kind of like gives you a new perspective on things. Cause I think we should always be developing in those ways. And it's an awesome book and Thank I you. will put a link in the show notes cause it really does take that to another level. You know, I've read things like recent trout and get to aha as well by um, Andy Cunningham, another good book on brand DNA and kind of positioning and things. But yeah, it sort of takes that to another level in a kind of a practical approach and gives you some ways to define and utilize other areas and those associations that you talk about. And there's some in there that are just never even considered. So it's an amazing, amazing sort of resource to use. Thank you. And that was really the objective, right? It's called the workbook. So brand positioning workbook. So it's not about my philosophy on branding or what's coming next after the purpose. It's really a lot of experience distilled in these pages and a lot of practical, hopefully practical tools and tricks and exercises to help you think about it. So the biggest compliment I got is like, was the best book after Trout and Reese? I think that's over-exaggerated, but what I loved about, um, what I was lacking is, and that's the problem I see with a lot of positioning books is, okay, you're telling me you have this great philosophy or you're telling me what a positioning is. Now tell me what I can do literally yeah. from day one to day five to actually come up with my own positioning beyond hiring me, of course, right? I mean, that's what where a lot of these books are written as well. So and the feedback I'm receiving so far is that yeah, it's no marketing BS language and very practical, which which tells me, okay, objective delivered. I'm happy about that. 
Yeah, well, definitely does that. You're right. It is up, the recent trout kind of thing. It's definitely, it's up there with those, you know, with, in terms of on positioning, it's such a great resource. And like you said, it's a, it's a step by step and the way to actually deliver it, which like you said, there's so many books out there that don't do that. They tell you or give you yeah. a philosophy, like you said, but they don't give you a roadmap of how to do it. So to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. So how do you get from sort of generic brand strategies to truly distinctive ones? By exploring, that's going to be the lame answer, by exploring my 26 resources of brand association. And the reason for that is it depends on what is generic about it, right? You can look at it at various levels. So the way these 26 associations are structured is the way you define a positioning, right? It's always you start with a frame of reference. So what is my competitive set? What is my frame of reference from a consumer perspective? Followed by what's my benefit? What's the benefit I communicate to my consumers? And then how do I support that benefit? So there are really these three elements that make up a positioning statement that you need to take into account. So when you look at it from this perspective, and then you start to look at, okay, where does my source of generic come from? Is it because I'm comparing myself to the 26 competitors in my very narrow category? Well, maybe I need to open and look at my brand or my category from a different perspective. That's the frame of reference I mentioned earlier. So that's a potential source of avoiding a generic proposition or positioning. The second then is like, look at the benefit, right? And um, many of these, several of the association talk about the benefits. It can be, you know, a product tangible product benefit. It can be a brand attribute. It can be a sensorial benefit that you communicate. But you basically look at, okay, what is my competition doing? How are they talking about the benefit of their products? And how can I talk about it differently? And then the third area is, what do I say about my product or my offering that allows me to stand out? So you can have a generic benefit, but the support of that benefit might be unique. You know, typical example for me is like Dyson, the vacuum cleaner, right? So a vacuum cleaner sucks dust. Yeah, great. So you either suck dust better or faster, or I don't know how else you can suck dust. But what Dyson did is focus on one of the problems in the category, which is, you know, once you use your vacuum cleaner, your filter dust up, and the vacuum cleaner loses its power unless you literally clean it digitally. So what they did is, which I thought was brilliant, is this notion of doesn't lose suction. So they differentiate themselves not by saying, you know, we suck dust better and faster than anyone else. I mean, ultimately they went there, but they said, you know, our vacuum cleaners don't do suction. That's what they use as a differentiator when they launch their brands of vacuum cleaners. And I was in the US and I was working for the agency when Dyson launched in the US and I was, didn't work on it myself. But at the time, the belief was that no consumer is willing to pay more than $100 for a vacuum cleaner because it's so low interest and low involvement product. And here comes Dyson's with $399, $499, $699 vacuum cleaner. And it was a tremendous success. Why? Because, well, they told the Dyson story, obviously, which is, you know, the creation story, which is one of the sources of association. But then they used this extremely powerful, doesn't lose suction as a key differentiator and highly relevant benefit for consumers as a second source of brand association. So here is like, so I don't know if that makes sense. So really can reframe your brand and the way you look and talk at it. You can think about how do I deliver a benefit? You know, if everyone is functional, maybe I go emotional. If everyone is emotional, maybe I go functional. You know, that's perfectly valid as well. Or the way I substantiate my claims, um, as in the case of Dyson. So if you do that, so it's not rocket science. It's no matter, I think that's for me the other learning in positioning development, right? It, sometimes you have these individuals that say, you know, oh, no, it's a lot of subjectivity. You need a strike of genius, which only I can provide. Like, no, that's bullshit. It's, if you go through it systematically with the right tools, everyone can come up with a really compelling brand positioning statement. Of course, experience helps. Of course, cross-category experience helps. But it's not something magical that you just pull out of a head and say, you know, I sat down, I meditated for 12 days in my cave and then came down and said, Papa, here's your solution. You know, so it demystifies the process because it allows you to really come up with a lot of ideas and then decide, okay, is that a realistic idea or is that completely unrealistic? Maybe this one, no one really has talked about that, but maybe that's what makes it interesting. You know what I mean? It's like Dyson coming in and say, 
I'm going to triple the price of my vacuum cleaner and I'm going to tell consumers it doesn't lose suction as a point of differentiation. It's not rocket science, it's a systematic exploration of options. That's the way I look at it as well. Of course, and then you need brilliance and you need my experience and you need all these things that are very specific to me. But the reality is in 90% of the cases, everyone can do it with the right tools and the right methodology. I love the fact that you can, uh, from good strategy comes great creativity. I think it, you have that methodology and then from that, it gives you a base to work from and you have those ideas. And when Dyson, I remember when Dyson and the adverts they used to do with the founder and he used to talk about why he came up with, with it and also the the idea of the, uh, they had a, like a patent for it and, and all these kind of things, but it almost came across as this like space age, new technology. They managed to sort of get it across in the adverts, like you said, Said that it was different and it was different in every way the adverts didn't look like a, a vacuum advert you know the way that he was talking didn't feel like a vacuum advert it wasn't like all the other ones you saw on tv where it'd be someone would drop something on the floor and then they'd go and hoover it yes. up and you'd see a smiling person in the garden all these sort of things it was completely different it felt very clinical in a way it felt like yeah. a, a lab a lab environment yeah. that's the kind of yeah. thing i was the word i was looking for so it instantly just looked different and i think yeah. that they wouldn't have been able to do that without getting that positioning and that idea right from the beginning. It just wouldn't Absolutely. have happened. And I think in this case, to be honest, it, I'm sure you came back. I mean, you know, the quirky story of Dyson, I think it's been about 10, 15 years solving the vacuum cleaning, cleaning problem. And, you know, so the first reaction is like, how crazy must one be to focus on that life problem, you know? But to your point, the point that came out is, is a really beautiful design for this product and a really good performance of the product. So. Uh, I think, you know, the obsession led naturally to the positioning statement. And I know the advertising agency that worked at the time explored different creative ideas, including many that were not as focused on the product and down to Dyson itself. And Dyson always came back to, no, talk about my technology, talk about my product, talk about what it does, show it, because it looks basically the Apple strategy in communication, right? It's like, yeah. illustrate and demonstrate how amazing my product is and how cool it is. I think what... Dyson did too, it made, made it cool to vacuum clean for men. You know, I think that's one of the nice side benefits. Pushing around a, a Dyson vacuum cleaner in your living room made you feel more manly than a, a 30 year old looking vacuum cleaner from a competition. So I think that opened a whole bunch of new um, appeal to the whole behavior of vacuum cleaning. Definitely, yeah. It suddenly became a, a gadget, a piece of tech that you yeah. should have in a home. Yeah. Absolutely. And for so which you're willing to pay four times the price of a regular vacuum cleaner. Definitely, that's it. I mean, there's just on a tangent, there's a product in the UK, which is like a, a garden tool for picking things up. But you, is it garden tool? It's garden tool picking things up or leaf blowing type thing, but it's like a pump action thing. And that's they beautiful. a similar kind of way, they position it as like a, a gadget, a tech thing to have in the garden kind of thing. And it's sort of following down that route. But yeah, it was interesting when you said that then, because it uh, just sprung to mind. So how do you approach working with a new client? What are the steps you take them through in, in developing a strategy and positioning? Uh, the steps themselves are very generic, I would call them. So it's what I do in the steps that stand out. So the steps is literally, you know, step number one is defining the objectives of the whole project, setting expectations. Then there is a whole discovery phase, and that is understanding the internal perspective, so stakeholder interviews. And what this often sheds a light on is what are sort of like the unspoken pain points the company has, you know, what are the opportunities or the worries of the executive team so it guides your thought process but then you dive also into you know competition consumer understanding and the lens i put on, on these things is always brand associations right so what do the internal stakeholder really associate with the brand in the way they speak about it what about consumers what about competition so this association lens it's interesting because on one hand it makes it look very simple but on the other hand, it's very difficult to get there. So I can give you a page of, you know, here are the sort of like 26 brand perceptions um, or learnings you have about your brand. Or I can show you a simple page with sort of like a bubble chart, which focuses on four or five brand associations and tell you this is your current situation. And then I show you the same bubble chart and say, this is what consumers want. See where the disconnect is. So after this diagnostic phase, where it's often really identifying what is the real problem we are trying to solve here for the brand. Then I go into the idea development phase. So that's where the creative process kicks in, right? So here you start to, if it's a positioning, I use this methodology to explore what are my potential solutions by looking at the problem through these 26 different lenses. And that leads you typically to 50, 60, 70 potential solutions, most of which are crap. 
which is perfectly fine. It's just part of the ideation process. Uh, but then you start, as you do that, you start to see themes that emerge. You know, either we look at the category too small because we're always bumping into alternative usage occasions. Well, maybe we should be thinking about broadening the frame of reference of how we position the brand. So as you start to group them and create themes in your potential solutions, you start to have really interesting strategic discussions with your client about you know, where the real opportunities are, where the pain points are that everyone is beautifully avoiding, et cetera, et cetera. And then you boil that down to basically three, four, maybe maximum five strategic options that you really capture and craft as a brand positioning statement or as a positioning concept. And then you can run that through research, right? Whether it's qualitative or quantitative. So it's really discovery, explore options through this creativity approach, creative approach. And then it's sort of like the divergent phase of the process. And then it's about convergence. Okay, what are the teams we see? What are the key territories we can identify that we think are relevant? Test them and validate them and then implement them down the road. So that's typically the flow I go through. But what I'm noticing is because my starting point is not, ooh, let's see what we can learn from consumers with a wide open mind and let's take three months learning from consumers. I direct my thinking and the client's thinking in a way more focused way by focusing on what we know are successful triggers for building a brand. So you speed up the process significantly. And because you have the 26 sources of association in front of you, you can look at your brand and the problem you're trying to solve from way more perspective, right? So if you don't use the tool and say, Chris, you and I are going to try to solve this together, out of memory and experience, we'll probably be able to come up with, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 different ways to look at the brand, but definitely not 26. And if you look at a menu and say, okay, here, yeah, what's the purpose approach? You know, what's a brand archetype approach? What's a country of origin approach? What's a sensory focused approach? It guides your and my thinking into those lanes, which leads to way more ideas that you and I together would be able to come up without any tool out there, if that makes sense. It definitely makes sense. And when you said about country of origin, I, I was trying to talk to someone the other day about you can leverage that idea and things like, you know, the common idea of say Swiss watches or German engineered cars, stuff like that is kind of this. And like with the US, with regards to things like Coca-Cola and stuff like that, it's got a real intrinsic sort of American feel to it. When approaching country of origin, how do you look at that in terms of drawing from the country? What things do you draw upon? Is it traditions or is it sort of more of a cultural thing? It's both. It comes back. I look at it again through the lens of associations, right? So what do we associate with Germany? Well, it's definitely not fine cuisine, but yeah, it's obsessive engineering. So you look first for what are sort of like the natural associations with that origin, right? And that origin could be a you know, Toscana could be a region or could be a, so it doesn't have to be a country. It could be a specific region within a country, or it could be a specific moment in time developed during, you know, the great boom after World War II. I'm making stuff up here, but so origin doesn't necessarily have to be country. So then you look at, okay, what do I associate with Germany? What do I associate that could help me? What do I associate with Germans that could help me? What are values that I know Germans embody? that could help me. So maybe I don't say it's based on the German country or Germany as a country. It's based on a German mindset or a German way of doing things, you know, the German Reinheitsgebot for beer. So do I have associations that consumers automatically have with my origin? And are they powerful enough and unique? And can I make them unique enough to differentiate my offering? If that's not the case, or if you feel, you know, they are not enough powerful association, then you ask the question, how can I make them unique? Or how can I add associations that are consistent with the country of origin, but that add value to my brand? So when you think about two examples come to mind, one is Foster's, that probably outs me as being very old and having been in the category for very long. But Foster's is like Australian for beer. You know, this came in the wave of Crocodile Dundee movies, you know, there was a swell, awareness swell around Australia, but that was really it. And then you had a weird sense of, yeah, Australians are a bit rough and quirky, you know, but what they did is they took that literally and helped shape that perception by telling their stories through their advertising, by teaching you basically what it means to be Australian. 
So they took you know, a base level of association and made it more specific. Another example for me that comes that I mentioned in the book is Kerrygold, the butter. I know they're successful around the world, but they're extremely successful here in the US. And they are based on a variety of association. One is with um, Ireland, Irish butter. And Irish is a big Irish community here. You know, St. Patrick's Day is something that a lot of people have positive association. So there's a ground positive attitude towards Ireland as an origin. But then what they did is they started to bring it to life by these green rolling hills, you know, that feeds happy cows that leads to great milk. Um, they complemented it with, you know, a quirky, funny sense of humor. I don't know if it's you Irish, but now we associate it with sort of like an Irish humor. So instead of simply saying, you know, we come from Ireland, that's why our butter is better. They brought it to life with these rolling hills, happy cow, tone of voice that is quirky Irish, etc. So you really shape it to make it relevant and appealing to consumers, but also to make it unique to yourself. You know what I mean? And I'm sure that today, if your second brand of butter would came out and say, hey, we are from Ireland too, I still think that Kerrygold would have the edge because of how they customized, in a sense, this country of origin effect. Yeah, definitely. There's no, some great examples there. And well, yeah, I remember those Foster's ads. They were brilliant. So good. Yeah. So good. They were brilliant because they tapped into a sentiment that people were getting more and more aware of, in that case, Australia, but they took it to the next level, right? I mean, you could also have just say the red outback of Australia and then a good looking guy getting the girl drinking a Foster's, you know, you could have done that in a very boring way, but the way they brought it to life made it very unique and very appealing and very engaging, frankly. That's where creativity yeah, they brought sort of a more uh, down-to-earth feel to the brand as well with that kind of, yeah, down-to-earth, definitely. If you were to give some top tips to listeners to sort of sum up developing a good positioning and strategy, what are some top tips to focus on? Again, I come back to, sorry to feel like a broken record, but I come back to my brand associations because I don't see that being used in the category, in the marketing world enough. Um, yeah. It's uh, very few people who speak about that, but it's really ask yourself, what am I associated with today? You know, and for the listeners of your podcast, they listen to me for a few minutes. Like, okay, what are the things they associate with this guy? You know, well, he talks about positioning. He has a German accent. You know, he uses a couple of swear words. Um, he looks like he did a lot of research. So try to understand what are the associations that I currently, that people have about my offering or me. And then second step is really what associations do I need to create or do I want to create to stand out from my competition, to be relevant? You know, hopefully what some of your listeners will take out is, oh, it looks like he has a methodology that is different from others that seems very effective. Yes, that's the type of association I would like to create by talking to you. The hope that it's going to appeal to some people that are then going to buy the book. But so the question is, what are the associations I want to create and then the third question then becomes very easy. What do I need to do to get there? What activity do I need to do? How do I need to speak about it? You notice in our conversation, I brought up the 1200 case study to give some substance to my methodology. I talked about the 26 uh, sources of association to bring it a bit more to life. You know, I gave a couple of examples that apply this thinking. Obviously, that's in the context of a 45 minute podcast, which is a different medium than a Facebook banner ad, for example. But the question then becomes, how? what do I need to do to build this brand association to achieve my desire? And trust me, Chris, if you answer these three questions, what do people currently associate with my offering? What do I want them to associate with that offering? And what do I need to do to get there? You solve 80% of your marketing headache when developing a brand positioning statement, a guaranteed. Then you can go into the fine tunements and the details and, you know, the technicality of that. But if that's your frame of mind, you'll be better, in my opinion, than 80% of marketers out there because you focus on what matters to consumers. You focus on what is actionable. You don't overthink it. You know, you don't over intellectualize it. A hammer is there to put nails in a surface. That's what it does, right? So. You can play violin with it. You can try to cook with it. You know, no, it's like hammer, nail, surface. That's a fairly straightforward process, which is exactly what this association perspective does. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. You can see I'm obsessed about the brand associations, but I know it works. And what I love is that no one uses it in the category. And yet when you apply it to your own thinking or to your client's thinking, 
you see the light bulbs go on, right? You see the, oh my God, yes, and yes, it makes sense. I cannot have 12 associations, that's ridiculous. I need to focus on the most important ones. So, you know, you have this whole thought process that really is right on target because it does what it needs to do and very focused. Okay, I'm going to stop rambling about my uh, approach. No, no, please do. Was, no, because the thing is, when, <laughs> when I looked at it, it was I got the excitement when looking at it because I was like, there's things here that I've not fully considered, angles that I've not considered. And that to me was exciting because it was kind mm-hmm. of, there's opportunities here. And I always want to look to learn, like I said, and always creativity for me is an exciting thing. So anything mm-hmm. that can make things creative and open up doors rather than shutting doors is something that I really do enjoy. So I was kind of like, this is a great framework, a great methodology and something that can really benefit a lot of people from the people that are going to use the methodology to the businesses that are going to benefit fit the brands that are going to benefit but also then onto the consumers or the audience that's going to react to that brand because it's solving yeah. a real problem then you're actually solving a real problem as opposed to just defining something maybe that isn't there or tagging onto something that doesn't really benefit anyone yeah. so yeah it was absolutely really exciting so just before we go one last question i was asked is what drives yeah. you mad about your industry a lot of things one thing that drives me mad is the superficiality of our thinking You know, we live in this world where we take our information from headlines in social media. You know, we don't question the source. We don't question the information. And I feel it's a little bit the same in the world of marketing. You know, we're riding the brand purpose bandwagon without trying to ask a bit deeper, okay, how is it going to help us? Is it really applicable to our category, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just sort of like the lack of critical thinking, this third mentality. And you see that in many categories, a company switches from a very rational benefit to an emotional benefit or very emotional way to speak about the brand has initial success. Every competitor in the category follows through, you know, and then six months later, everyone is about emotional, you know, puppies and babies and all these kind of things. So it's sort of like this herd mentality combined with the lack of critical thinking in terms of, no, no, the solution to all my business problems, which by the way, I'm not really able to define is a brand purpose or millennial want experiences. And that's another thing. It's like not questioning the data or trying to go deeper around the data. And a very simple example here, I remember a couple of years ago, and then don't get me wrong, I work a lot with Gen Z and millennials. So I, I work with these concepts as well, but um, it was all about, yeah, they want cool brands. They want cool experiences. And then we looked at a tracking study that said, you know, Walmart is one of the coolest brand of millennials in the US. And Walmart is, as you know, this massive retail discounter. And they're like, okay, it's really not cool. It's a shitty experience. Why do millennial like that? Why do they like it? Because it's cheap, because it gives you value for money, you know? So yes, that applies to any category or any generalization you make, um, have some of these stereotypes. But there is more to it. There is the desire for value or money. There is the desire to have, you know, a better sound system for less money. That is a very tangible driver in consumer behavior that we don't think about often. Um, So it's sort of like this superficiality of our thinking and this dumbing down to headlines that really drives me nuts and which I hope my tool does the exact opposite because it deconstructs, it forces you to go deep in the weeds and then come back. So so herd behavior and superficiality of thinking. That's the part that on one hand drives me nuts. On the other hand, allow me to stand out, to be honest with you, because um, for clients who look for that, you know, if a client comes to me and says, I want a brand purpose, I usually refer them to someone else. Not because I don't like brand purposes. In reality, I work with many clients that apply brand purposes to their positioning statement, but it needs to make sense and solve a problem. It shouldn't be because... Oh, I read a, an article on in AdAge that everyone is telling me that brand purpose is the thing. So maybe that's why I should be looking at it. Wrong thinking behind it. You can yeah. see that gets me excited too. So, <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. I think purpose is an interesting one that I think a lot of people, they think of purpose and they think of this big thing that has to be, you have to make this big statement in order to try and get this across this kind of what you believe, you know, what you stand for, what, what's the reason you exist beyond making a profit, whatever, you know, this purpose. And I think purpose is, it plays a role and it plays a role potentially from a point of view more internally, sometimes just to kind of yeah. almost as a rudder and a guide, as opposed to an external thing you have to always shout about. And I think that purpose I've always said, doesn't have to be these big things. It can be like little things in your industry that are just can solve people's problems. So if it's just, yeah. you know, if you're in, in the accounting space and it's the fact that 
accountants struggle to feel like they're actually valued by their own customers. You can be a brand that champions that purpose, then that's something that actually matters to people. And I think people, when they think of purpose, they think like this massive thing, but I think you're right. It doesn't have to be that. It's not always about that. You're making a brilliant point though. So purpose has a lot of power internally, right? To get you excited to go to work every morning, to make you feel like you're taking part in something bigger out there. And we see that in technology, right? A lot of engineers want to work with for the big Googles and Facebook because they feel they can have a bigger impact on the world than working for a small company. So that is perfectly fine. But I remember when you looked at the evolution of the purpose, after the initial discussion around purpose, then some people started to say, well, in addition to the purpose, you need a positioning statement because you need to translate this internal purpose into something that is motivating to consumers. You know, so you need another tool to bring the purpose to life. So my initial reaction was, well, if you need another tool to bring a purpose to life, maybe the tool is not, you know, if I need a second hammer to use my first hammer, maybe my first hammer is not as powerful as I thought it would be. Change the hammer, yeah. That's right. But then you also see like, you know, coming back to the Dyson example, if this guy didn't have a purpose in life, I don't know what a purpose is. I mean, if you dedicate 15 or 20 years of your life to solve a suction issue with a vacuum cleaner, if that is not a purpose, I don't know what a purpose is. Now, it doesn't save dolphins, you know, it doesn't um, uh, remove uh, racial inequality out there. But that is a very purpose driven endeavor, which is Perfectly fine, perfectly valid, perfectly uh, great to talk about. The problem is really the 90% when we use it as a, how do you call that, like to put lipstick on a pig? It's still a pig. It just happens to have purple lips now, you know, that's, and that's unfortunately how I would say 80% of the purposes out there are being developed and communicated. And that's a complete nonsense. Yeah, I think they confuse with the drive for things like CSR and things like that, I think, as well. Mm-hmm. Sometimes where yeah. I kind of combine the two into thinking we have to have this thing, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Obviously, it's a great thing to do. But in terms of that as a proposition to the audience, which is what you're trying to reach, is sometimes it misses the mark. And that's when you get these issues where people get called out on it as well, which can be a problem by their own and, customers. Get called and out on backfire it. big time. And I think one of the challenging part is like research, right? Because if I asked you, Chris, do you want to shaving cream yes i'd like a shaving cream because i shave regularly why would you like a shaving cream that's you know also promoting social justice and you know saves i don't know the panda bear in china it's going to say of course i want that but i say well great but then it's going to be 50 percent more expensive than what you're currently using and oh by the way my shaving cream is not as good as the competitor shaving cream you're going to drop me within a second but talking to you through my research and I can talk to a thousand Chris and I'm going to say, oh yeah, 89% of Chris's want, you know, to save the panda in China in addition to having a shaving cream. So the type of data you collect in your research and how you collect it can significantly shape your own perception of, you know, what the consumer actually want. And that's then when you indeed have the shaving cream that saves the panda in China at 50% higher price point and no one buys you in, in retail, you know, you can go and say, but the consumers told me they like that, you're still going to fail, you know, and it's not rocket science, it's common sense, typically. So um, don't get me wrong, I have nothing against the pandas in China. I think they're awesome. But um, just as an example. Yeah, definitely. Totally agree. Yeah. If, if that shaving foam solved a real issue, like shaves, but you also moisturizes afterwards and gives you this, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of thing, then it's something that you'd probably pay a little bit more for because yeah. it does actually have a benefit for you, you know, at the end. Yeah. yeah. Or it has now four blades. I mean, it's like marketing make as well but then you're like okay four blades i may be better than three blades in my razor but then it takes a, a life on its own like do i really need six blades on my razor as opposed to four but yeah those are more tangible things that address the specific problem i'm trying to solve or task i'm trying to carry out and then it becomes more important to me than anything else you tell me but yeah i want to save the world i want a sustainable world you know i want to save the hunger problem but i also just want to have a clean shape well in my case i don't but um you know, I understand if you want a clean shave, that's your priority. Definitely. Well, it's been, been amazing having you on. It's been a real pleasure and it's been really good to chat. And I could talk all day about this. You know, it's been really good to sort of pick your brains about the subject. And where can people find out more about you, more about the book? And where can they find out more about some of the things you do? Yeah, so on, uh, the way, best way to find me is on LinkedIn. It's uh, Uli Applebaum. And the book is it's primarily distributed through Amazon. So it's the Brand Positioning Workbook. Just type in Brand Positioning Workbook and that'll pop up. 
And if you want to reach out to me directly, you can reach me out also through my website, which is first minus the minus trousers.com. So first the trousers with um, little minus signs in between. And uh, there you can see what I do and the type of client I work for and uh, what they say about me as well. So, um, but uh, Twitter is a no-go for me, but uh, professionally LinkedIn um, is the best way to connect with me. That's great. Thank you. What I'll do is I'll put all those links in the show notes, link to the book, link to the website links your LinkedIn and um, yeah it's been a real pleasure and I really appreciate it so thank you for coming on yeah thanks for having me uh, Chris I really enjoyed the conversation we just put together a weekly brand tip video series which is designed to help you to unlock your brand's potential and stand out from the competition and if you're interested if you just go to elements brand management or one word dot co dot uk forward slash weekly hyphen brand hyphen tips sign up and you'll be delivered a three to five minute video a week straight to your inbox. I'll put a link in the show notes if you're interested. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to receive more, you can subscribe in all the usual places. We're talking iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. Please, if you get a chance, rate and review. It helps a podcast to kind of get a bit more visibility and allows us to keep on producing these podcasts. Have a great week. Catch up soon. Keep those brands unified. <laughs>